Ebola, influenza, HIV, measles, Zika, malaria, and all other forms of diseases are what we specialize in here at the Center for Disease Control. Is what I would have told you four years ago. You see, I joined the CDC on the pretext that I would be helping people. That I would be curing disease. Participating in overseas operations and helping third world nations by means of vaccinations and medical attention. That has not been the case. For the first year, it was. And coming off my service in the Marines, I used my GI Bill to pay my way through college and to earn myself a degree in biology with a minor in evolutionary genetics. The CDC always seemed like a mountain peak for me, like the pinnacle of healthcare professions. Naturally, when they accepted my job application, I was enthralled. However, I would not be working for them as the standard geneticist. They informed me that a distinct lack in field workers demanded that if I took the job, I would be working as an emergency response specialist. It appeared that my work in the Marines would pay off, as I was physically fit for the job at hand. I was specifically going to be working as a member of a security team who would accompany various scientists on response missions. It wasn't the kind of work that I had in mind when I pictured the CDC, but it seemed harmless. I was so wrong. I first had my suspicions on the second field assignment that I had. My team of four security officers and me were sent to accompany several doctors as we went to go investigate a possible outbreak of pneumonia, which had stricken all 423 passengers on board a cruise ship off the east coast of Mexico. It sounded like a relatively simple assignment. Along with the security of the ship, set up clinics, isolate victims, and treat them. I remember thinking that it was odd they were sending an investigation team for a supposed pneumonia outbreak. According to the captain of the security force, HQ received an SOS call from the ship's captain, stating that there is an unknown viral outbreak containing about 80% of the on board. We have direct orders that they not be allowed to dock back on shore until we have identified the outbreak. I didn't ask any more questions. I instead geared up and got in the helicopter. We flew in silence for some time. My captain made sure that I and the rest of my team were locked and loaded. Our firearms were mostly for show. A sign of authority and a way to make the scientists feel safe in the midst of uncharted territory. I never thought that I would have to use it. It was complete fucking chaos. Upon landing, we were not welcomed or greeted by anybody. We were instead surrounded by the smell of copper. I shouldn't have been able to smell through my hazmat suit, but it was so strong. It was practically palpable. One of the scientists was very visibly ill, coming off of a helicopter ride. And upon catching the strong scent, he nearly vomited in her own suit. We made our way to the control room of the ship, but we found no one there. Lopez, safety off. I obeyed his order and I clicked my firearm off of its safety. We made our way through every compartment in the leadership section of the vessel to find the place completely barren. Checking our corners and proceeding with caution, that's when we heard a voice come over the intercom. Get out of there! I spun around, gun trained at the door that lies ahead of us, before I took notice of the intercom that lie ahead of us. You need to get down to the cafeteria. It's the only place we've effectively locked down. I heard one of the scientists bring up a radio and mutter some gibberish back to what I can only assume to be somebody from HQ. And we began making our way into the open deck of the ship. Ahead of us lie the ship's main attraction. It's Olympic-sized swimming pool, complete with three water slides and a fully decked out child section. The deck of the ship was empty. Almost artificially empty, like the director was filming a movie about the last man on earth and had ordered everybody off of set. We made our way past the pool to find the barricaded cafeteria. One of the signs is not. I'm Dr. Kelly Marsh. I'm from the CDC. Can you open the door? There was silence. And then there was laughter. 
Coming from behind us, we heard the cackling of an elderly woman. She stood up on the opposite side of the pool, staring at us and laughing. She looked tired, withered and with visible pain in her eyes. The longer that we stared at her, the more that we realized that the laughter sounded forced. Her voice sounded tired, and upon further examination, she appeared to be coughing up blood in between her cackles. We stared at her in disbelief before and the door swung open. Get inside now! Me and my crew more than happily obliged the captain's request. It took you people long enough. We've been stuck in this room for almost a week waiting for her. My captain had put his hand over the man's shoulder and shoved him against the wall. Sir, you need to calm down. I can assure you that me and my team have done everything in our power to get here as fast as humanly possible. Now, I need you to tell me what happened. The man sobered up as did the rest of the crew there. I took in my surroundings to find that among the captain of the ship, there were three lower level employees on the crew's liner. I didn't see anybody else. The room looked like hell. It was evident that he wasn't kidding about their week-long stay. One of our diving instructors took a group of people out for a lesson. They returned half an hour early, reporting that a young woman had stepped on an urchin and fell ill. Our nurses on board had no idea what was wrong with her, but at first, she exhibited flu-like symptoms. A day later, she began laughing, uncontrollably laughing at everything. She laughed so much that she began to hemorrhage her throat and was coughing up blood. All of our attempts to sedate her were met with harsh rejection. She simply refused to go under. She coughed up blood onto one of our nurses, whom we immediately quarantined along with the woman. In the middle of the night, however, the woman had escaped her room, and that's when we called you guys. We locked ourselves in this cafeteria and we have not let anybody in. Over the next few days, we began to hear the laughing spread throughout the ship, clawing its way through the walls. Yesterday, it began to die out, and now here we are. Our doctors ran diagnostics and checked up on the four remaining staff members. They were all okay. My captain radioed HQ and uttered a few letters and words that I didn't understand. What I did understand, however, was the order from him to all of us including the scientists, that we were leaving the ship effective immediately. What about the residents of my ship? What about the infected and those hiding out? The ship captain interrupted. We will be sending an even larger task force to effectively deal with the outbreak on board. But we need to get you and your crew out of here now. The captain did not object any further, and we all began making our way back to the helicopter. The lady was still on the other side of the pool, blocking the door to the main bridge. Man, please step away from the door. We are sending help for you. One of the scientists yelled out. Help us? The lady began to laugh. Not laugh. Hysterically bald tears that made her cry out in pain. We stared at her for a few minutes before I was told. Lopez, take the shot. We don't have time for this. I hesitated, but after having my job threatened, I raised my gun to her. This was when all hell broke loose. The woman sprang up off the ground like a scene out of The Exorcist, and began to sprint around the pool for us with such intensity that we were all caught off guard. I took the shot and I hit her right in the left shoulder. It didn't even seem to phase her in the slightest bit. She just continued her manic craze sprint for us. We all pivoted to the other side of the pool and began to make a run for the door. We were however cut off by a little boy who had appeared out of the darkness ahead of us. The lady stopped chasing and watched us intently. Now with an old lady to our backside and a little kid to our front, we were completely cut off. The boy pointed a finger at us and began to laugh hysterically, but unlike the old lady, he did not pursue us. He instead fell to his knees and in between laughter, he managed to mutter out in a weary voice. Make it stop hurting. I turned around to my teammates, unsure of what to do. I took the lead and I didn't hesitate this time. 
I put the barrel of my gun against his head and I put the poor kid out of his godforsaken misery. At which point, the old lady screamed bloody murder and resumed her chase. We ran for the door, which me in the lead, I opened the door and I began making my way to the helicopter. The others trailed close behind, but upon turning around, I saw the captain of the cruise liner being held back by the old woman. She held his arms behind him, preventing him from going any further, and dragged his body outside of the room, outside of the bridge, and to his fate. The rest of us made it to the helicopter and flew back to the shore over in California. I later found out that the ship was scuttled. Only took one torpedo according to the reports. As for the remaining three crew members, I never saw them again. I can only assume that they are living in never-ending torment over what transpired on that ship. Or most likely, they are being held in a sub-basement of the CDC. Either way... It doesn't matter because this is only the tip of the iceberg for my sins against the world committed for the CDC. I can still see the look on that poor kid's face at night when I try to go to sleep. They didn't even try to help those people. That's when it became apparent the line of work I was destined for with my new company. Following the incident off the coast of Mexico, I was thankfully blessed by a long stream of normal job assignments. I traveled along the east coast dealing with measles and smallpox breakouts, one really bad influenza epidemic in a rural anti-vaccination town. And yes, for all of you who had messaged me, I have dealt with Ebola. Point being, I had a relatively normal experience with the CDC for the rest of the year. I wish it could have lasted, but fate had other plans. The town of Kilimur was as small as it gets. A population of about 1,500 and fully decked out with a mall, post office, pizza joint, and a hospital. I remember thinking it looked like a cute town as we were flying in. We were called in on a last resort from the hospital. A string of people had fallen deathly ill, and not a single doctor in Killamore could explain what was afflicting them. And there were five patients, all of whom were experiencing liver failure and were in a great deal of pain. You don't have any leads to is what the affliction is, our lead doctor asked. We've run every test in the book. Unless you would like to try acupuncture or some bullshit hippie healing crystals, I don't know what else to do. That's why we called you. The doctor was clearly tired. He had likely been up for a long time tending to the patients. Patient Z is in the room down the hall. That's probably a good place to start. We nodded and we prepped to begin our work. My team of five was split up to guard one patient each. I was being tasked with guarding patient Z. His name was Henry Lawson, and he quickly warmed up to me. What's your name? David, I answered back. David, why do you have a gun? Are you a cop or something? No, I'm not a cop. So then, what are you? You don't look like a doctor. You're right, I don't. I'm your personal bodyguard. I said jokingly as I knelt down beside his bed. And it's my job to make sure that you are safe during your recovery. He smiled at me and for the next two weeks, we bonded. Although we knew nothing of the affliction that was taking hold of the five patients, we knew for sure that it was not contagious by means of contact or air as nobody who had made contact with the boy had become ill, which only made the fact that there were multiple patients all the more confusing. In between the routine tests that were run by my colleagues, I played chess. Henry had told me about how he was on the chess team, and then he wanted to become the world champion like Bobby Fischer. I wish you guys could have seen his face when I brought him a wooden chess set on the fourth day in Killamore. I had never seen somebody so happy over something so seemingly simple. He kicked my ass over and over again, and as time passed, I found myself getting quite good at the game. I even learned a few openings that he had taught me. One day, I stood in the doorway guarding him and our doctors while they examined him. That's when I overheard their conversation. Can you describe its shape? Where exactly is it? It was like a tooth. 
Henry responded, sounding groggy and tired. It looked like a tooth that protruded out of the ground. That can't be right, though. That thing was at least ten feet tall. What were you doing out there? I was just going for a walk. The woods are really cool, you know? I just saw it sticking out of the ground about a mile in. I walk that trail every day, so I know for a fact that it wasn't there before. I walked up to it to get a closer look, and then I touched it, and I blacked out. I woke up here like four hours later, and now here we are. One of the doctors began writing something down on a notepad, and then flood the room reaching for his phone frantically. And you're an orphan, you say? That's correct. He closed the notepad, thanked Henry for his time, and he walked out. Me and Henry spent the rest of the day together, talking and playing chess until he drifted off to sleep later that day. He was always so cheerful. So much so that I was caught off guard the first time that I saw him in pain. He began to cough violently out of nowhere. I had been reading a book while he was sleeping and I nearly dropped it upon hearing him. He kept coughing for what must have been at least 20 seconds. I called for my team to come get him and help him out. His body writhed and shook like he was having a seizure. All that I could do was stand by the door and watch as my team tried desperately to stabilize him. After two minutes of fruitless efforts, he flatlined. Damn it, get the defibrillator! My blood went cold the moment I heard the ear piercing sound of his now a dead heartbeat. I watched them blast his chest with electricity five times trying to bring him back. It didn't work. We all stood around quietly for a few moments before Henry sprang back up in his bed until he was now upright and alive. Except he couldn't have been. His heartbeat monitor confirmed that he was dead. One of the doctors jumped back in surprise. Jesus Christ. Henry began to frantically feel around at the bedsheets in disbelief. His skin had turned pale and he had a look of terror on his face. What happened? Me and the hospital staff were quickly moved out, as our team of doctors continued to run tests on him throughout the night. I watched in through the glass in my window as much as I could. I witnessed them extract blood, bone marrow, and go through a monotony of tests. And the strange thing is, is that Henry did not seem to react in the slightest to all of this. I slowly fell asleep in the chair outside of his room. The next morning, another patient had flatlined. I didn't bother going into the room to watch. I instead headed to Henry's room to go talk to him, before I would be inevitably forced into taking him back to HQ with us. Henry, what's going on, man? I don't know. He said truly sounding confused. The doctors say that I'm dead, but I feel great. Better than I've ever felt since I woke up here. The only thing that's wrong is that I can't really feel anything. He stuck out his hand as if asking me to grab it, which I did. See? I can't feel it. I didn't say anything. Lopez, we found it. And the noise came from my walkie. I quickly left the room to take the call. Found what? The tooth. We've got a team here getting this thing out. Make sure you're prepared to extract Henry and the others. I choked up. I knew they were going to take him away, but at the same time, I was hoping that I wouldn't have to. Henry, we can't help you here. You're going to have to come with us so we can treat you. He just nodded in agreement. Two hours later, a chopper arrived to retrieve the patients. Henry was put under so I didn't get to say goodbye. In case you're wondering if Henry's currently being tortured, I assure you that he's not. I would like to tell you that the CDC is trying to cure him, but the case is more on the lines of, and they're trying to understand him. I think they believe that the secret to immortality lies with Henry, and the other people who came in contact with the tooth. And they might be right. They think that they can cheat death. But that doesn't mean he deserves to be locked up and experimented on, like I know he's been. 
They told me that he died a month into observation. But I know it's all bullshit. That kid was a fighter. And it would take more than a month of isolation to take him out. One of these days, I'm going to get him out of there. I swear in my life before I leave, I'm going to get them all out of there. I don't know how they did it, but the CDC has figured out I've been posting my experiences working with them. Seeing as there's no harm now, I suppose I'll come clean about my name. It's not David Lopez. My name is Jacob Garrison. I've worked with the secret task force of the CDC for 13 years, who specialize in cleanups and cover-ups of dangerous diseases, viruses, fungi, parasites, and as you can remember from my last installment, the unexplained. It would sound cliche to say, I don't have much time before they close in on me. I have to type this out as fast as I can. But thankfully, that is not the case. They know my stories have fallen on mostly deaf ears. So why rush out in a hurry to go stop me? Plus, I've chosen to finish typing this out from a rather populated coffee shop in my town. I know how much they hate public cover-ups, so I suspect that they'll leave me alone for now. That being said, this is going to be my final update. For starters, I later received confirmation of Henry's status a year after they had proclaimed them and all the other patients of the tooth dead. A patient of level 6 had broken out of custody, and it was up to me and my team to contain and neutralize her. Sorry, I'm just going to assume you know nothing about the biosafety levels of the CDC. There are 6 levels. Well, four according to public sources. BS1 is the safest of all the labs, and dealing with viruses such as E. coli and influenza. They all progressively get more dangerous and harder to contain up until level 4, which is where stuff like smallpox, Ebola, and the bubonic plague are studied. Level 5 is dealt with by NASA for any possible exoplanet life forms and microbes that may be received through meteorites. And then there's level 6. Only one level 6 lab exists in the entire world, and it's in the depths of the CDC HQ in Atlanta. There lies all unconfirmed diseases that the public has zero knowledge of. As you might have guessed, it's also where Henry and his friends are being experimented on. We geared up in body armor, hazmat suits, and were loaded to the brim with firearms, with the sole intention of killing patient 866. The briefing stated that she was a child of a survivor from the Nagasaki nuclear bombing back in World War II. She was captured and had apparently been living in BS Level 6 her entire life. And when I read the report briefing, I got furious. My service with the CDC expired in two years, but I didn't know if I could handle another job assignment from them. I was being forced to lead people to die and to be experimented on in. Now I was being told to hunt down and kill a girl whom they had kidnapped. I thought of the possibility of them being asked to do the same to Henry, which only made me more mad. Jacob. My captain had grown to like me at this point. He had stopped calling me by my last name. We're going down in 15. Are you ready? No. No, I'm not, Tim. He walked over and he put his hand on my shoulder. I finished loading in my clip and I looked up to give him my attention. You don't have to go on this assignment if you don't want to. I'll just make up some bullshit about... No. I interrupted. I'm going. I picked up my shit and I walked over to the elevator to go wait for the others. He sighed and resumed gearing up. I knew what he was trying to do. He knew that Henry was still down there. And he didn't want me to see whatever they were doing to him. I was going to find out one way or the other though. The elevator rattled like a plane flying through turbulence. As we all stood shoulder to shoulder silent. We weren't necessarily afraid of the task that lay ahead of us. So much as we were afraid of the scene that lay ahead of us. They had shut off power, ventilation and all access to level 6. Immediately after patient 886 had ripped herself free from her restraints. Apparently she had gone on a rampage and had killed two of her scientists in her chamber upon freeing herself. 
If she had enough force to rip off a three-inch bolted-down handguard, then would her steel door be enough to contain her? No, it wasn't. The elevator doors opened to reveal the sub-level in the ruins. The chamber which had once housed the patient at the end of the hallway could clearly be heard, as the door was now swinging on one of its hinges creating a metallic scraping noise. I motioned for two of us to squad check the sides while me and Tim took the front. We proceeded with caution. Moving slowly and deliberately, so not to step on the broken glass or corpses which now lie across the once clean floor. When we reached her room, we looked through the glass to find that she wasn't in there. Ramirez, check under the windows. The new squad member moved hesitantly, past the doorway and looked behind the door along the walls of the room before coming out and giving a thumbs up. Alright, we stick together. Nobody trailing off. The captain told all of us in a stern voice. Overlord, this is my squad. Can we have power back in level 6? It would make this search go a hell of a lot faster. Negative. We can't risk your leaving through the elevator. Damn it. Alright, we'll start at the back. We'll push her forward until she's got nowhere left to go. We proceeded to the farthest end of the level and began to search room by room, always checking the air vents for signs of forced entry as we moved along. The wing was alive with the sound of patients taunting us and begging us to let them go. At one point, I thought I saw the cruise liner captain, and in a room next to him, I swore I could see the old lady. Stop, Jacob, you hear that? I shook my head at Tim as he proceeded forward. Jesus Christ. We heard from behind us as one of the bodies whom we assumed was dead sprung back to life and had begun to drag away one of my squad members who was guarding the back. It's her, take the shot. We all began to fire on the patient but out of fear of hitting our friend, our shots were embarrassingly inaccurate. She dragged him off to the left and into one of the chambers before we heard the sound of his neck snapping, followed by the laughing coming from the cruise liner captain. Jacob, Aaron, cover those windows. Everybody else, follow me. We moved into position guarding the windows on the left side of the room, while our squad moved in position and flooded the room. She just stood there facing the corner of the room on the right side. The corpse of the man who was once a loving father and a member of my team lie motionless on the ground. Open fire! Gunshots echoed all throughout the sub-level as the screams of all who resided within it began to scream and cry at the loud noise. No matter how many bullets we seemed to load into her, she stood there against the wall motionless. When we all had used up our clips, we watched her slowly sink and fall motionless onto the ground. We watched in silence for a few seconds before Tim picked up the corpse of who I think was named Felix and began to head towards the elevator. We all followed suit. HQ, this is Mike Squad reporting in. Asset is terminated. We have one casualty and are heading back up. Roger that. Restoring power in 30 seconds. Make sure you're at the elevator. As I made my way to the elevator, I looked to my left and there he was. And he was asleep. Probably doped up and he was in a room with two of the people I had seen at the hospital in Kentucky. On a table like a rock fragment, with strange etchings carved into it. Jacob, double time, let's go. I didn't respond. I instead stared at him for a few more seconds before slowly making my way back to the elevator. I was silent before Tim said to me, I'm sorry, Jacob. Yeah, that's supposed to make me feel better. He didn't say anything as we rode away back up and out of the depths until... Jacob, there's a tear in your suit. I looked down to my glove and sure enough, there it was. A small two-inch tear along the right side of my wrist, so tiny that I hadn't seen it. They all backed away from me and Tim put his hand on my shoulder. Come on, let's go get this checked out. I began to have a mini panic attack. Did something get in my suit? There were only three airtight rooms down there and we hadn't gone in any of them. I began to get the sense that people were watching me. Doctors were backing up from us and letting us pass through them, 
As I saw, I was being led to a quarantine airtight room where a doctor lay inside with a needle, ready to put me to sleep. I knew what they had planned for me and I wasn't having any of it. I quickly slammed the back end of my boot onto Tim's foot. And when his grip was lost, I bolted down a long hallway to our left which led to the parking garage. Jacob, get back here. I didn't listen. I instead sprinted as fast as I could. Stripping myself of as much as the suit as I could before, I slammed my body through the door and I quickly began to survey my surroundings. I saw a red car coming by and I intended to get it. I flagged it down and once the driver had stopped, I borrowed the person's vehicle and I drove myself as far away as I could get and I held up in some shitty motel where I first began to write this. A van just pulled up outside of the coffee shop. I know that it's them. I know that I'm not infected with anything, but the CDC doesn't care however. They don't want to run any risks, even if it means killing one of their own. I can see two of my old squad mates staring at me from the parking lot, giving me a look that says, it's time, and I couldn't agree more. I think that I deserve whatever fate awaits for me, for all the times I just stood there and let them take those people away. I'm going to give myself into them. Before I do, however, I would like to say that I'm sorry. For all of those who expect help from me but found nothing but pain, if I somehow make it out alive, I'll be sure to write to you guys again. However, I don't think that's going to happen. I know too much and I am too much of a liability. Just know this one thing though. The government is hiding diseases from you, among other things. Don't let them fool you for a second into believing that they have your best interest in mind. And to Henry Lawson, I'll see you soon, my friend. Jacob Garrison, 